uh, well, not all of it, but a lot of it. And this is Pam. Bless you, Pam. Thank you. Thanks. Good to see all of you again. Love Sunday mornings. See all our friends and family. Um, yeah, so I hope you all had a good week. I had one crazy week this week. <laughs> Couldn't have gone any, any worse, I think. But yeah, here we are. We do what we have to do. So yeah, but, but in the midst of everything that goes on, uh, during the week, whatever happens. You know, when you know the Lord, you know the Lord. Eh? And he will take you through it, and he will remind you, and he will tell you that that he is with you. And a lot of that happens sometimes when we just being still and listening to worship and joining in in the worship in our, in our own time. And yeah, it, that, if we have these beautiful moments, and a lot of revelation will come as well, when we're just listening to it. But I was listening to a particular song in this last few days, and uh, a song that I really love. It's a song by David Roos, and it's called True Love. I think we used to sing it a lot at the vineyard before. Love that song. It's beautiful. And um, listening to the lyrics, uh, the lyrics are also from this book, uh, Song of Songs, um, Song of Solomon, as, as some might say. And it's from chapter one of that book. Now, that's normally not a book that we would go to and read, is it? Uh, but it's beautiful. It's got such beautiful poetry in it. And um, essentially, it is a bride and a groom, and in between, they're friends. And, and, and in the version of the Bible that I was reading it, it says, it starts off with she, meaning she's speaking, and then the friends are saying something, and then he is speaking. And I loved it. It, it was so beautiful. And, um, but she says something in the beginning there. She speaks about how she loves this groom, and she can understand why all the maidens want him. And then she also says something. She says, don't stare at me because I'm dark. She says, it's because I work in the vineyard. And I was like, me too, sister. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> so yeah, there was some revelation there for me. <clears throat> yeah, so yesterday we had a wonderful time with a group of people that came here from our church. They helped us to pack all these boxes. There was a lot of groceries that came in many, many boxes. So they unpacked the boxes, got a system going and enjoying themselves, packing it. So all these buckets are all full and they're ready to go out, uh, bringing some hope this Christmas for some people who are in need. But also what happened was we put a card in there. I printed a card just to, to let the people know, uh, uh, you know, if they're looking for a place of fellowship where they can come. And so I told them, on the back of the card, write a little personal note, say something so that you know, it's not just a printed thing in there. A nice little written note by hand will, can be very encouraging. So some of the ladies also took it. Like some of the guys were not that keen, but the ladies took it. And they're going like, okay, what scripture can you write in the back of this? And they were thinking, okay, they're saying something. One of the first ones I think that probably came out was John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave is only begotten son that whomsoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life okay and we know the king james version in that that's how well we know it yeah but like it says in the nlt for this is how god loved the world this is how he loved it he gave his only son that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. So, today I'm going to speak a little bit about um, taking on the yoke of the Lord and I entitled the topic, His Burden is Light, okay? And looking back at that scripture of God, John 3.16, that scripture we, have, we know so well, and that's what we base 
our faith in. The world here that God is speaking, for God, this is how God loved the world. He's talking about us, humanity. And it is without exclusion. It is for everyone who believes in him. No matter your social standing, rich or poor, with a title, without a title, Lord, Lady, it doesn't matter. It's without exclusion. And it doesn't matter your physical appearance, light, dark, tall, short, anything. There's no stipulations. And it doesn't matter where you come from. Your nationality doesn't matter. And it doesn't even matter who you know. This is how he loved us, that he gave his only son. And he loved us so much, he was not willing to let us go, no matter what. He gave us a second chance. Though Adam messed up, he didn't adhere to what was required of him, Adam was fooled, and death came. But God didn't let us go. He sent his son, the new Adam. This Adam was foolproof and death proof. With him, we have to run a race. He's called us to walk with him. And he called us to run a race with him. But the amazing thing is that this race has been won already. We are running a race that has been won. We share in the victor's crown. He didn't choose us to be on a losing side. But we must run this race. We must be participants in this race. We were chosen to partner with God. We were chosen to be part of a mission. The mission in Matthew 28, 16 to 20. I think I'm reading from the NLT, the New, New Living Translation. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee. Uh, this was after the resurrection. They went to, sorry, this was, yeah, after the crucifixion. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority on heaven has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Oh, wait, hang on. I think I missed something there. I think I edited that a little bit. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. It is not complete to just go and make um, and find people and bring them to, to a place of baptism. You have to continue it. You have to start, do the rest of what is commanded and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. So is Jesus asking you to teach them like he teaches us? The answer is yes. And you can only teach what you have learned or what you are learning. <clears throat> In LA, I'm, I'm, I'm actually reading this book here, Alexander's, Alexander Fenton's book, Turn It That Way, Doing Spirituality. It's got Samuel Kiston's name written all over it. Must be yours, eh? I said it on camera now. I can't not return it. <laughs> yeah. And in the book, I will quote, it says, I quote, you can only make disciples to the extent we are disciples. You can only make a disciple to the extent that you are a disciple. Unquote. And we, and we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. 
Easy one to remember, 1111. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Here, Paul is writing a letter to the Corinthians where he's addressing many issues that are having in the church. In other words, he's addressing it, he's discipling them, okay? And he says to them, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. That's what's required of us. Others can only listen to what we have to say if we know we ourselves, how they say, practice what you preach. Okay? People are more likely to follow Jesus if they see that you are an exemplar of Christ. It's like me telling you, you know what, I see something in you. I think you're going to be a really, really good bass guitarist. Why don't you let me help you? I'll guide you through this whole thing. I'll help you. And yeah, I'll try and convince you, you know. I, I know, know something, I know uh, a few makes of bass guitars, maybe like a Fender Music Man. <laughs> yeah, and I know that, you know, some of them got frets, some of them don't have frets. Um, maybe I heard one or two bass guitarists while watching with Sean on YouTube. So I'm telling you, no, no, I'm trying to tell you this, this is the way to go. And yeah, and if you, if you decide, yeah, you know, maybe it's a good idea, and tell me, come with me, come, let me go get a bass guitar. Let me try this thing. And I go with you to the music shop. And I hand you over to a salesman. And that guy is going to try and get commission out of you, right? And you look at me and you're like, hmm, now what? Now what? Uh, what must I do? I'll have no more information for you. <laughs> I only play the recorder. But if somebody who knows, maybe somebody like Sean, is with you, he'll be able to give you some advice and tell you, you know what, know this, that, 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 as a beginner, maybe do this, uh, go for that kind of a guitar, and, and, and that kind of thing. And you're more likely to listen and do better in, in, in this coming from him than from me because of what he has learned and know about it. Okay. Because it's not right for me to try and mentor somebody in something that I have no clue about. Okay? Again, I quote from this book, Doing Spirituality. It says, people catch who we are, not what we persuade them to become. Right? Therefore, also Paul's advice to Timothy. Timothy was a young leader in the early Christian community who had to disciple Christ followers, okay, like a very young pastor going in to take care of God's people. And he says in the scripture, keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who hear you. Good advice, right? Good advice. Keep a close watch. And Jesus advised us such as well. Jesus says we must stay close to him. He says you must learn from me. That's what he's asking us to do. He says, and I will teach you and transform you. We read in Matthew chapter 11, 29 to 30. This is what he says. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, for my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. The Lord is asking us to walk with him, and he will teach us. And he likens this walk to that maybe of two oxen, him being the experienced one, you know, two oxen are yoked together. They have that wooden thing over them and they walk together. But he's the experienced one. That's what they would do with somebody, a, a, a new animal, a younger animal. They would yoke them with an older animal. And in this scripture, it's like Christ is the experienced one. 
he knows where to go. He knows the path, and he knows what is required of us. And we being the inexperienced ones, we have to attach to him so that we don't wander off. We learn from him. We go from wandering about, having no purpose, not knowing right from wrong, trying to find acceptance in all the wrong places, to being next to the one who loves us. He says, I am humble and gentle at heart, and, I will, and you will find rest for your soul. And I remember earlier in the days when I read that, I was like, hmm, you're saying rest, and then you're saying yoke and burden. And I'm like, yeah, but then think about it. Think about the alternative. If not his yoke and his burden, what's the alternative? Yeah, although, although in this case, you know, Christ was actually talking about religious uh, legalism and, and the rituals at that time that the people had to fulfill. It was burdensome to them. There were so much of things that they had to do, and it was hard. And that is how he called them, and he said, come, learn. Learn from me. Learn what it is all really about. You will learn, and then as you learn, you start to conform, and when you conform to the Lord's teaching, you will then be transformed. And when you're transformed, this burden is light. It's easy, because you know it. And you know it's what you have to do. You know, we can search in a lot of places, and we can do a lot of stuff. We can find all kinds of charities, all kinds of social work, all kinds of good works. But unless you find yourself yoked to the Lord, you're going to find very little rest. Very little rest in all the things that you do. You will eventually get exhausted and it will eventually show in who you become. So through this journey, while we are learning, while we are conforming, while we are transforming, we can reach out to others. We can help others and guide them to take this yoke. We can help others and show them, listen, though there's this to be done, I'm the result of it. Okay? You become a testimony. And while you are getting better, you help others to get better. And you might not be the one who will see them right through all of it right through their journey with Christ. But know this, who you are at the time they discover Jesus makes a huge difference. And who you are in a church community makes a huge difference. I often think about my own journey. I mean, where did it all start? How did I... Um, come to know the Lord, and uh, yeah, you know, now I can say I've been a Christian most of my life because I've passed that halfway mark, you know, I became a Christian quite, quite late in my life, of course, I think in my mid-twenties or somewhere, and you know, I don't know where it all started, or how it started, it's not something that I can remember, but I remember some people some people that were there a long time ago that made a difference. And I think it was a long time ago that I was separated for God. And I think it must have happened when I was just a kid, maybe six or seven years old. But I was not a Christian. I was not a Christian for a long time. That, like I said, in my 20s. But I'll tell you a little story of what happened when I was just a kid. <laughs> when I was about seven years old, um, I have this aunt, Auntie Bubbles. She's sitting there. I always thought she was my sister. You know when you're a kid and you have somebody living with you, you think, oh, it's just, well, yeah, she's just my sister. Because I never called her auntie. That's why. I had a, I had a nickname for her. I won't tell you. <laughs> and I would not go to bed without her. I mean, we, we shared the same room. I was literally stuck to her. Yeah, later on she betrayed me and she got married. <laughs> Yeah, so before that, so yeah, we would share the room. And uh, so one night, I remember, 
my dad took us, uh, so I have two older brothers and Auntie Bubbles, took us all and we went to the fun fair back in the day. Yeah. You remember the fun fairs will come? I think they still do it now, but it's not like it used to be then. The fun fair with all the rides and all the kinds of acts and all kinds of things happening. Um, so we went um, very happily. And I remember, and I actually still remember this, though I was so little, there was this lady who had a snake, a huge, big, long python around her, like around the neck thing, sitting there very glamorously. And you could go and uh, touch the snake. It was something that time. I think now you see them. The other day, I think Sean and I saw somebody on the road with, with a big, long python around them. It was something, and uh, yeah, so it was that, and uh, I think maybe I was a bit scared of it. I can't remember all of that. I was, I was very small. But then we went home, we go home, and uh, go to bed. Took my, with my auntie, of course, I won't go to bed without her. And I didn't wake up. I didn't wake up for a long time. I didn't wake up for about seven or more days. I was in a coma. I went into a coma. Uh, my parents took me to hospital, um, Carnes. It was a nice hospital then, by the way. Yeah. Took me there, and uh, the doctors were, of course, trying to figure this whole thing out. There's the child there. don't know what happened to her. So, of course, they ran a whole lot of tests trying to figure this out, and they eventually uh, did what's called a lumbar puncture. You know, you go and take fluid from the spine, because the spine sends the neural messages like to the brain from there. So take out that fluid and let's test it and see what's wrong with this child. And they found out that I had meningitis. It was quite serious. Um, so they prepared my parents, told them a lot of things, and also told them, you know, if she gains consciousness, she won't be the same child anymore, maybe. She might be paralyzed, whatever. Neuro things, whatever, for the mind. And yeah, that's a bit crazy, eh? Imagine that. But then I woke up. I woke up, and I kind of remember I woke up. I looked around, and like, where am I? And as little as I was, seven years old or whatever. I actually remember it. There was a nurse that came there. She looked at me and she went, you're awake. And I'm like, I'm looking at her and I'm trying to figure out what's going on. She ran out and a doctor came in later. And he came in, a, I don't know what you call the instruments, but you know, it's like that little hammer thing with a rubber thing on the end. And he came and he's asking me a lot of questions. He's knocking my knees and my legs are flying all over the place. He's trying to establish that I was well. And I was fine, and then kind of I think a few minutes later, so my mom was there, all happy to see me, and I'm still just happy to see maybe the chips and the juice or whatever. Like, you know, what's going on? I was perfectly fine, perfectly, perfectly fine. Nothing was wrong with me. My mom told me later that a lot of people prayed for me. A lot of people, she said, were praying for me. But one I remember in particular was my dad's friend. His name was Boya. Everybody got her uncle Boya somewhere, right? And his wife's name was Peggy. Right, eh? And his wife's name was Peggy. And they were praying for me as well. And that's the one person that I remember so well. Because after that, uh, they used to still pray for me, my mom and dad used to take me to their house. They lived high up in this house in Unit 9, long driveway up. And I remember going to the house, cell meetings, going there, and these amazing people just wanting to minister to you and pray for you. And yeah, but they used to pray loud and whatever, but never mind. They, they had something. Something was going on there. And I couldn't, I couldn't forget that. And I feel, you know, something was planted. Seeds were planted in me. Something changed in my life there, and they probably knew it as well, and they probably continued praying for me. Yeah, but my family, we still remained Hindus. We were, were always Hindus. My mom never stopped me from going to church, though. She was 
different, right, for a Hindu family. And but the mom was like, "No, go church." <laughs> yeah, I think she too knew. But later on, when I was in high school, I took it ill again. I started to get uh, different forms of uh, not different forms, a form of like seizures. And then, oh, that's when the drama started. That's when it started. All the families, especially some older ones. Yeah, that's happening because you're not doing the porridge prayers. It's happening you're need, because you're not carrying cavity. You're not observing this. You're not observing that. Nothing can be worse than guilt, shame, and fear. And that's what these people did, whoever they were. That's what they did to my mom and dad. Put fear into them made them feel guilty, made them feel shame of what they were not doing. Yeah, those things, even if you're a believer, guilt, shame, fear can take you into a very, very dark place and a very lost place. Okay? Therefore, rather, that's the alternative that I was talking about, rather, the yoke and the burden of Christ. Yeah. That's my story. I'm telling you that. But you know what happened eventually is that I knew. I knew somehow that there was something more out there. That there was a God out there who is not a God of fear. I figured, you know, all the things that they asked us to do, everything that they made us do, was based on fear. If you don't do that, this is what's going to happen. What kind of a God is that, I ask you? Can you be of another faith and say, and preach and talk and say, God is love, God is love when all that there is, is fear. So I searched, eh? I, I, in my heart, I, I, I was looking, I was looking for, for something else. I was looking for, for that, the God that didn't want me to worship him just out of fear. I remember when I was in high school, I started reading, uh, reading those Hare Krishna books as well because they, they were available, they were given to me by somebody, I think. And I was reading it. It made no sense to me at all. Never mind the fact that the, some of the names there were like very, very long names. And they, I was just trying to figure out what is going on here? What is this? Eh? It just didn't, didn't make any form of sense to me. Yeah, but then I started, found myself going to church later on, and church, church is where I learned to follow Jesus, this place. Being part of a family of believers is where I learned how myself to walk this walk. Because you can't do it on your own, you know. You, you remember during COVID, we were all doing this whole online thing. COVID is over. Some of us are still doing it. Sometimes legitimate reasons. But some people stayed there. They stayed on that online lounge church. I knew that I couldn't do it. I knew if I sat there in my lounge, no matter how good the quality of the video and the sound was and all of that, I knew I would perish. I knew I would perish. Yes, but you know, church people, they can really hurt you. Huh? You heard that before. You go to church and you think that they, you know, it'll be okay. Things will be okay. But there is where you get hurt. Guess why? Your siblings are here. That's just like in your own house, you have sibling rivalry here too. 
You fight with your family, don't you, sometimes? You get upset with them, they all got their own personalities and their own character and you can get really upset with them sometimes. But still, when you're having a function or something together, you're calling them to take their family photo because you want them there. Eh? Okay. You want them there because you love them. You love your family. But if you want to really know who's your family, ask Jesus. He'll tell you who's your real family. Let's read it in Matthew chapter 12, verse 45 to 50. The true family of Jesus. As Jesus was speaking to the crowd, his mother and brother stood outside asking to speak to him. Someone told Jesus, poor guy, he's just the messenger. Someone went and told Jesus, your mother and your brothers are standing outside and they want to speak to you. And Jesus asked, who are my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he pointed to the disciples and said, look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. How wonderful, brothers, sisters, mothers. We're sharing in the same mission. We're sharing. We are here because we are here to the will of the Father. And does that not make you real family? And yes, we will fight. We will say things that is not nice. We will say things that might be misinterpreted. The context of it might not be very clear. Whatever it is, we're just siblings. We're just family. And we are going to get it wrong sometimes. But we need this family. We need this family to cheer us on when we are walking with the Lord. We need each other to say to us, listen, it's okay. We're going to get there. You're taking on the Lord's yoke. He's going to teach you some things. He's going to teach you how to walk a straight line. Not, you know, in the oxen plow, they will plow straight. Not going this way, that way, because he is going to keep you straight. And it might be, yeah, a little bit of a difficult thing to do. But look around you. Look how many brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers are around you. Doing the same thing. Wanting to do the same thing. All wanting to do the will of God. Let them cheer you on. And you too can cheer them on. Okay? Let's do this together. Does not, it's not a solo act. The mission of Christ has never been for yourself. It's never been just for you. It is for the benefit of everyone. And that's the only thing we've got to know. It's not yours alone. All right? And you guys are my family. And even as I go through this journey, I would love it if you are there to be with me, to help me through it. Know, know what's going on here. Know who the father is. Know who the mother is. Eh? Acknowledge them. Acknowledge your leaders. Learn. Learn from one another. That, that, like we're learning from Christ, learn from one another too. And teach. Learn and teach. Yeah. We must all play nice. That's all. Let's just play nice. Let's enjoy this journey. Let's enjoy it. It was meant to be a wonderful and a beautiful journey with the Lord. So let's enjoy it. Yeah. I think I didn't I didn't tell you. But today is the day you can go home early and enjoy that biryani. <laughs> eh? I want Christmas has come early. I hope that that message encourages you. Next time, you know, um, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart when 
people want to leave the church out of silly misunderstandings, silly things. You know, you, if, if you have to go, if you have to leave church, if you have to go fellowship elsewhere, come and talk to the pastor. Come and talk to them and tell them why you're going. Listen, I feel God is calling me to go there and, and do this and that and um, minister or help them out or whatever. Wonderful. Wonderful. Sam trains us, our pastor trains us. It's not training us also just to keep us here. He would like to see you get more involved. And if it means it's somewhere else, then yes. He will hear you out. He will advise you. But don't run away quietly. And then we wonder, hey, Rani will ask me, did you see so-and-so in church? I'm like, no, I didn't see them last week too. The following week comes, they're like, we're trying to figure out where you are. Families don't behave like that, hey? Families know, the other person will know and something or, or you will tell your parents what you're up to and where you're going. And you'll, you would look for their blessing in what you're going to do. Same here. Same here. All right. Thank you, guys. I think before we go, let's take a really good look around and, and, and you know what, let, let's just pray. Let's ask the Lord, you know, if you had any fallouts with anybody here, not just in this church, but other believers as well, just think about what happened, why it happened, and how bad is it really that you can't forgive and you can't uh, look at that person again and you can't talk to them again think about the others on the outside that are watching as well so let's just um, yeah let's just close our eyes and let, let's just pray let's just ask the Lord to come Father I just pray even as we heard your word God and even as you taught us how to walk this walk with you and even as we venture into this and, and, and heed to what your word is saying, oh God, taking on your yoke, trying to walk with you. Father, I pray that we would do it in community, Lord. We would do it in community. And when we need help, we would say, help me. We won't do this and try and do this on our own, be our own heroes but we will reach out, we would help our brothers and our sisters. We would acknowledge them, we would look at them, we would say a kind word to them. We would be very quick, Father, very quick to forgive. And our ears will be quick to listen as well, O oh Lord. Guard our mouths, Lord. When we say something, if it is not words of encouragement, Father, if it's not something that's going to correct and lift someone up, may we learn not to say it as well, O oh Lord. Be with us. As a church community, Father, as Vineyard Church Chatsworth, I pray, Father, that your spirit will be here. Our guidance will come from you, Lord. We will look to you. We will look to the mission of Christ, the thing that you are calling us to do, the will of the Father, and we know, Lord, if we gather together as a family and we do your will, then your kingdom comes, Lord. Be with us, we pray, O oh Lord. Be with us. Let, the, let your words minister into our hearts. Come, Holy Spirit. Teach us. Teach us, Lord. Let us not be ignorant, Father. Let us not be ignorant. Lest the devil comes and starts ministering. Let us know one from the other. Let us not play into the hands of darkness. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Give it a good hand. 
And as she was speaking, I felt the sweet presence of God from one heart to another. And yes, you are family, and you are, we're all one, and we're thankful to God for you. The one thing that the Lord was reminding me with a message like this, disciples are learners, and we learn till the day we die. Also, we get disciplined from being discipled every day. And when somebody is correcting you in the family, wherever, whatever is happening, uh, when correction is there for you, take it because it only makes you a better person. And Jesus is teaching us every day of our lives because we make mistakes every day. We are not perfect in an imperfect world. So it was a beautiful message, and you have this to go, you know. I think for homework, I thought I will reflect on those people that, that I'm not so close with. There's no problems, but I'm not so close with, you know, for this week, I'll do my homework. You do yours. If you have some people that, you know, have slipped away from you, just make one call this week. So I'm, th I'm thinking of you and, you know, I'm praying for you and, you know, uh, you're so precious to me. You're such a good soul. And, uh, yeah, just, we also just want to say goodbye to the online people that you are listening and God bless you all. Amen. You can go home now.